We are in the middle of a series on sin. And in fact, this might be our last one. But last time we discussed um, the notion of prevenient grace and um, also some other issues relating to the fall. And it, it necessarily raises the question, in light of the fall and its disastrous results in the area of the will, because we talked a lot uh, about, from John, particularly chapter 6, about the paralysis of the will and how nobody can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him, and other verses like, like that. So it raises the perennial question, do we have free will, and what is free will? So this will be, a, I think, a fairly short segment, but I think it's, it's worth exploring the issue uh, I'd like to begin by reading from uh, the Westminster Confession and uh, just to remind us again of the dreadful state that the fall has put uh, fallen mankind into. It says, Man, by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. Let me say it again. Man by his fall into a state of sin has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as, as a natural man being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. And that's, it's that last phrase that addresses what we talked about last time with reference to prevenient grace. But notice how it talked about how being holy under um, enslavement. And as I said last time, we did look at the notion of prevenient grace just very briefly. In my, in my opinion, uh, it's mistaken for numerous reasons, one of which is that it, it clearly denies the wholly lost ability of the will to do any spiritual good accompanying salvation. It just, to me, seems manifestly clear that prevenient grace is, is inconsistent with that. Now, when it comes to this issue of the bondage of the will, Martin Luther actually wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will, and uh, it was his favorite book. Uh, he, he really thought that it got to the um, main issue of what the Reformation was all about and how um, this bondage of the will because of the fall, how uh, intricately it's related to the notion of um, grace alone. So, Man is unable in the flesh to believe in Christ, and this paralysis raises obvious questions, which have plagued the church from the beginning. Um, Romans 9 is an example of Paul dealing with this issue, isn't it? But I did want to address this issue. How can God hold us accountable for something we are unable to do? Uh, that was actually a question that um, many people have asked from, well, down through 
the entire church age up until today. And there was a big collision between a guy named Pelagius and Augustine over that. Because Pelagius, who was eventually declared a heretic, <coughs> um, said that God would never command us to do something unless we were able to do it. Um, but there is a basic question that I'm sure some of you may be thinking. Do we have free will? And my response is, it depends on how we define free will. Um, if by free will, you mean the moral ability of a non-Christian to choose Christ, then the Bible emphatically says no. Um, as we noted from John 6 and elsewhere, that man is unable has inability to come to Christ unless the Lord draws him. Why? Because we are dead in sin. And by dead, it means we're really dead. Uh, no spiritual inclinations to Christ at all, other than hatred, um, which the Bible makes very clear that there is enmity or hatred. Um, if you ask a non-Christian if they hated God, uh, I doubt very, very, you know, if they would say that they hated God. But according to Scripture and its definition of what hatred is, then God says that is the situation. Now, if we were to define free will as we usually understand it, as the ability to do what we want to do, then yes, every person, regardless of their belief, is free. And that's important for us to understand in this discussion. If we define free will as the ability to do what we want to do, then every person, Christian or non-Christian, is free in that regard. We are free to do what we want to do. Um, God is free, and obviously, and we are free. But our freedom uh, can never li limit His sovereignty. That's something we need to always remember. I, uh, speaking of remember, I remember when my kids were young and, uh, they had freedom and I had freedom, but as dad, I was more free. <laughs> and the same thing holds true with God. We are free and God is free, but he's more free than we are. Um, all right, now. Switching back to the issue that at hand in this discussion of the freedom of the will in the in church history uh, regarding this debate, guys like Augustine, Luther, Calvin, and Jonathan Edwards all have given us really keen insights into uh, the freedom of the will, uh, making distinctions between natural um, freedom and moral freedom um, and so forth. For example, uh, Jonathan Edwards defined the will as the mind choosing. That, that is, um, and I think he was really on to something, there is always some cause behind our actions. Uh, if you think about it, it cannot be a causeless effect. Everything we do is um, caused by something. Uh, if by free will, uh, um, when I say that, uh, that the essence of, of free will is self-determination, and when we say that free will is the ability to choose to do what we want to do, um, then 
that's self-determination, which really is the essence of free will, isn't it? And we always choose whatever inclination in our heart is strongest at that moment. I'll say that again, because this is a, a significant principle. We always choose whatever inclination in our hearts is strongest at that moment. I remember the first time I heard that, and uh, I was taken back, and I thought, what? But the more I thought about it, the more I uh, see that there is real truth to it. Um, let me ask you a question to illustrate this. Why do you sin? Why do I sin? The reason why we sin is because at that moment, the desire to sin is stronger than our desire to obey Jesus. Remember I said that, that, the, that freedom of the will consists of the fact that we always choose whatever inclination in our hearts is strongest at the moment? Well, that's how we can explain why we sin. It's because at that particular moment, the desire to sin is strong in there, our desire to obey Jesus. And as I said, there is a distinction between natural ability and moral ability. We, everyone, Christian and non-Christian, has natural abilities. You know, we can think, we, our, reason, our reason is uh, reasonably intact, though it has been affected by the fall. But we can, we can still think logically. We can choose. Um, we have natural limitations, like birds can fly, but we can't. And um, fish can swim underwater. Um, they're adapted to that, or our, our bodies have lungs, uh, and that sort of thing. But it's in the more moral area that the will is in terrible bondage. Um, getting back to choosing according to our inclinations. I would I would go even further and say that we, we have we have to choose according to our inclinations. We always choose according to our strongest inclinations in every situation. Um, we always do what we want to do. Always. And you say, wait a minute, Mark. What if I am coerced? You know, if I'm in a situation where I'm forced to do something against my will, well, that's not doing what you want to do, okay? You know, that's a, that is an exception. I'm talking about in uh, situations where you have the, the freedom to, to actually choose. But let's, let's take a, even a situation where um, your choices are severely limited. Like this. Suppose you're uh, being mugged, and the man says, "Your wallet or your life," and your options are limited now to two, right? <laughs> but even in even in a situation as coerced as that, you will choose whatever inclination is most strong in your heart or mind at that point. Uh, if self-preservation is the key concern and the strongest motive in your heart at that moment, then you will hand over your wallet. If um, if you don't care that much about self-preservation and you, you're more concerned about standing your ground, then you risk, you know, you'll choose saying no or try to fight or whatever. So everything else being equal, you don't want to give your wallet away. But even in this limited situation, you're still exerting the principle of doing what you want to do. Um, if you take a hypothetical situation in which you place a horse, before a horse, a bucket of oats and a bucket of barley, 
which he has utterly equal desires for. Okay, this is really hypothetical. I mean, we're talking about totally equal desires for both the bucket of the oats and the barley. Then, what would happen, according to our understanding of the freedom of the will, is that that horse would be paralyzed. He'd be standing there, staring, unable to choose, because there um, wouldn't be some strong inclination to cause his mind to choose, unless some other um, consideration came into his mind, like, I don't know, something. <laughs> but the point being is that even something as trivial as where you sit in a classroom or what you eat for supper, unconsciously and very quickly, um, we make decisions um, regarding, say, for example, the classroom situation. Um, all these things are, are again, might be unconscious, but you might have a preference for outside seats because you want to be able to get out, out the door real quick if need be or something like that. And so you're naturally inclined to take a seat at, at the, uh, on, on, uh, on the outside if at all possible. What I'm saying is that there are, there's always a cause behind our actions. Um, there, actually, if you think about it, there has to be a cause because a, a causeless event is absurd. Uh, nothing can cause something. Um, uh, besides, if we were able to make decisions without any moral input uh, or any input at all, then they would be, you know, how could how could God judge them as being morally? Um, good or bad if if we we're able to do morally neutral actions and of course jesus says that all of our actions either f um, flow from a good tree or a bad tree my point is is that our will is still intact we still have a reason but the non-christian because of his affections his inclinations um, being turned away from Christ, actually at enmity with Christ. And this is important. He will always freely choose to reject Christ. And that's important in our discussion here about the bondage of the will. Is it based on an understanding of the will? Is that the non-Christian is not being forced um, to be kept away from Christ. They are freely choosing to reject Christ based on this principle that we're talking about, that we choose that which is the strongest inclination in our hearts. And the strongest inclination of the heart of a person who's in the flesh is not love for God, but um, hatred towards the living God. But please notice it, it, that the, they're not being coerced. This inability is something that they freely choose. Again, if we define free will as doing what we want to do, then everyone has that freedom. Everyone, Christian and non-Christian, Christian, but as I said, the terrible dilemma, the awful dilemma for the unregenerate is that unless God sovereignly performs heart surgery by regenerating the person, by giving them a new heart, um, new affections for the Lord, um, in which their hearts are inclined towards Christ, then they are in that state of the bondage of the will. Um, 
So, God is totally free, but he cannot choose evil. Now, this doesn't diminish his freedom. To me, it, it enhances it, I think. And likewise, in heaven, we will not be able to sin. You know, I'm talking about the freedom of the will, but we will not be able to sin. But that won't be something to lament. Um, we will not be able to sin in heaven, even though we will be free to do whatever we want to do. But the thing is, y'all, since all inclination to sin will be gone in heaven, there will never be any desire or ability to sin. Um, and before I uh, close, I wanted to make a comment about a growing movement amongst Christian leaders, theologians, philosophers, and apologists. Think of people like um, Alvin Plantica, William Lane Craig, <laughs> and others. Um, and it concerns me. And it has to do with an unbiblical view of the will. And the technical term is libertarian freedom of the will. Now we've just talked about the freedom of the will, but this is this is designated the libertarian freedom of the will. And what they espouse with great vehemence is that this is a freedom which um, is said to be able to act contrary to their inclinations. But more significantly, that according to the libertarian view of free will, that even God cannot constrain us without denying our free will. Um, it's not good. The bad thing about this view of free will is that they use their definition of free will to determine the viability of other beliefs on um, whether or not it fits with their preconceived views, uh, libertarian views of free will. In their mind, they state exactly what Pelagius, the, um, one of the earliest heretics stated, and that is the notion that Ability limits responsibility. Ability limits responsibility. Um, so they would have a big problem with what I said about um, the effects of the fall and um, how it is paralyzed will. So um, according to them, our choices are not determined in advance by God, and hence his, sovereign, his sovereignty is severely undermined. But if we, do, if we undermine uh, God's sovereignty, then we're, we're denying who God is, because sovereignty is one of his defining characteristics. If God is not sovereign, he's not God, period, uh, exclamation point. But just getting back to what I started off with is I think we're finishing with the doctrine of sin um, before we go on to how it's overcome, which I'm glad to do. Um, just wanted to emphasize um, that in a very real sense, even those who are in bondage, and enslaved to sin and dead in sin still are freely choosing what they want to do. Um, I didn't want to leave anyone with the conception that they were anyway, anyway being coerced by God or anyone else. 
theirs is a free act of paralysis, if you will. They freely choose to not choose God. So, let's pray. Father, thank you that you have revealed to us things we could never discover on our own. Some things are very unpalatable, like sin, and there is consequences. But the darkness of sin does highlight and necessitate grace, because without sin there would be no need for a Savior, um, no need for the cross. And so I pray that you would um, help to deepen our understanding of sin to the end that it would deepen our understanding of the beauty of grace and the atoning work of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.